Hello and welcome to episode three of LearnerPrivacy.org. I'm your host, Charles Severance. And the title of our episode is Getting Lost on the Way to the Cloud. So in my very first podcast, I talked about how in 2000 we had local data, just because that's how things were. In 2010, we all took a trip to the cloud, including open source, although open source, we kept an option to, uh, to stay local. Uh, and by 2020, my university is best I can tell. There's not a single bit of learner data that's stored in servers that belong to my university. And so that's sort of the beginning of this podcast. But I kind of wanted to go back and take a look at why things happened the way they did. It wasn't, it wasn't all bad. There were, there were reasons for the way things happened. If you go back to 2000, you think about the time it took to buy server farms and the cost, the planning, the fact that you know you'd, you'd order them and four months later a giant truck would come and then you'd put them together and maybe they worked, maybe they didn't work. Somebody trip over a power cord, the cooling would go out. What operating system are you going to run like Ubuntu or Red Hat? Did you buy a load balancer for this thing? Did you buy a NetApp for your storage? Oh, those cost a lot of money, but they work really well. Oh, but then you got to upgrade those, and then you got a separate bunch of database servers. They might have a different operating system, like they might run Solaris, maybe they're Oracle. Oh, and we got to now upgrade the operating system, and oh crap, all the, all the applications have to upgrade because we just went to a new version of Oracle, right? And part of the problem was the software we were all running was just kind of quirky, complex stuff. I mean, I think the biggest mistake I made was doing anything with Oracle, but you couldn't help but do it with Oracle because universities were in effect held hostage by Oracle DBAs that told everyone that would listen that you can't run anything but Oracle to do, rely do it reliably, but Oracle's really hard and you got to pay a lot of money for it and you have to make us Oracle DBAs in charge of every project. But backing things up, right? What kind of hardware did you remember robotic tape drives? Remember regular tape drives? I mean, backup was terrible. So, so ultimately, if you think about it, to say that that the university's wasting a, spending a million dollars a year to run a learning management system, if you think of all these things, it's not surprising. A million bucks for a piece of software if you add everything about it hardware and everything. And, and, you know, we didn't really have an option in 2000. We wanted to build this software and we wanted people to use it. And once the hardware is in place, you had to deal with the software, right? And the software was not friendly to us. Maybe once a year, you'd get a new version on a bunch of CD-ROMs in like July. And then September was never fun, right? Because you put all those things in, you ran some Perl scripts. If you decided, oh, I want to skip this year and make you know, not have to work all night first three weeks of September to figure out what's wrong. Uh, then the next year was even worse. And if you did some kind of local customizations, then you pretty much were at the point where you could never upgrade again. I mean, it was an interesting situation in the early 2000s where a new LMS was very attractive in the market because it was always competing with the three or four year old version of the embedded, L the entrenched LMS that was already at a school. And so they're like going from Blackboard Basic Edition to Blackboard Learn. Well, you might as well go to WebCT at that point. I mean, it, it, the difference just to upgrade your on-campus LMS was often more. And then your new vendor was all excited about getting you and then they would convert all your data and they make it as easy as possible. And and so switching vendors became kind of a thing in the early 2000s because Upgrading the LMS software was so painful. I mean, not only hardware, but also upgrading it. And there were so many things happening in the 2000s. I mean, the 1990s was when we started being able to have a network and figured out little things like what we did with. 1994 was when the web happened. Blackboard was founded in 1997. That's just like three years after Netscape. It's really kind of impressive. And Facebook was founded in 2004. So the 2000s were ancient history. YouTube was founded in 2005. Here's a question. When was Rackspace founded? No, it was founded in 1998. When was Amazon AWS founded? 
It was founded in 2006. Early AWS was pretty crude, pretty simple. When was Canvas founded? Canvas was founded in 2008. So Canvas was born into this world of nascent AWS, and they just bet on AWS. Turned out to be a really good bet, right? But we, we forget that there was a time before AWS, before YouTube, even before Facebook. So Amazon really is the, the, the bellwether of the cloud, right? Amazon EC2 gave us Linux servers in 2006. They gave us uh, object storage in 2006, ElastiCache 2011, uh, and the Aurora serverless database, which I think is the coolest thing they've ever done, honestly. That didn't happen until 2018. That's two years ago. If you were using Amazon at scale before 2017, and that's pretty recent, you required a very particular set of skills that you acquired over a long career. You really had to be a student of Amazon to use Amazon effectively. I will say now in 2018, 2019, 2020, I can run servers at production, at scale, and I can do it sort of part-time, and they kind of manage themselves on Amazon. Amazon is now amazing. But prior to 2017, and certainly prior to 2015, Amazon was not amazing. Amazon was cool, awesome, but difficult, right? So let's just say you're a school and you got a learning management system and you're running Blackboard or Sakai or Moodle and you're keeping it local. You got to deal with all the hardware problems. You got to deal with the software problems. You got Oracle DBAs who hold you hostage, who basically say you can't run any other database on this campus, but if you run Oracle, we're going to make your life a living misery. Um, but then you might say, oh, let's move this LMS to Amazon. Well, Amazon in 2015 was a complex thing and folks didn't want to, couldn't learn it fast enough, right? Scary software updates dates, grades didn't go away. All Amazon really solved in 2015 was giving you hardware. You didn't have to wait six months for your hardware, but you were running software that required Oracle. And so now you had to just like go into Amazon and get Oracle and you had that same BABA problem and it was even more expensive than what you were doing before. And then Canvas comes along in 2015 and said, Hakuna Matata. It means no worries for the rest of your days. This whole idea that university IT didn't really need to have any skills led to a loss of IT developer talent. They didn't have interesting things to do. They lost the ability to affect the LMS's core direction to meet faculty needs. Hakuna Matata. We're spending that same million dollars, but whoa, all we do is go to a forum to upvote feature requests and go once a year to a conference. Hakuna Matata. They got all our private data. Ah, we made them sign a FERPA agreement. Ah, Hakuna Matata, right? Now, during this time, I don't think anybody really asked, is there any question as to whether SaaS is the ideal model or is there some kind of middle ground and everybody was just kind of Hakuna Matata on that, you know, it's like, Ah, this is good enough. Let's uh, let's see where this goes. But something else changed in between 2015 and 2020. That was a period that Amazon was getting much better. They were simplifying, 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 using solid using, using solid state disks, super flexible virtualization. You could get giant servers. You could get 96 CPUs, 384 gig of RAM bunch of solid state disk and you could pay four dollars an hour less than the person taking your order at McDonald's and you could have what used to be a room full of hardware oh and you could give it back at a moment's notice you could go up you could go down and then Amazon Aurora serverless which is my favorite thing MySQL and Postgres and Amazon loves Postgres no Oracle in this it gives you amazingly instant scalability backup with literally zero effort on your part as a customer, right? So those who use Amazon or Aurora serverless are, it's so much easier to keep your costs low and your performance high than it ever was before. And then other vendors came out with different kinds of markets like DigitalOcean, which is to me, the Linux box under your desk. 
And now what you do is you get four CPUs, 32 gig of RAM, 32 gig of SS, 300 gig of SSD for 32 cents an hour. That's cheaper than just having a box under your desk. And the other thing that happened is campus IT folks did other things. They weren't working on the LMS, but they were building other software and they learned AWS, right? So they know how to use AWS now. They do it for this app or that app or this other little, little patchy thing or a little LTI tool. Campus IT uses, is, goes to AWS first now. They don't like, oh, let's buy some more hardware. The LMS was the reason, the big thing that they had to let go of so that they could switch and slowly but sure, surely learn about AWS. And so that puts us in a position where we have a lot more AWS skills than we did in 2015. And AWS is easier also. Going back to the Lion King, Hakuna Matata is a temporary state. If you watch the movie, the whole idea of you're on vacation and you're ignoring your responsibilities, it literally didn't even last until the end of the song in the movie. When the song finishes, we go back and see what the consequences of shirking responsibility is, right? So the idea of permanently handing vendors our data now and forever, to me, should not, cannot, and if I have anything to say about, will not stand. I understand why this was sort of a path we had to take, right? And I look at campus ITs, been on vacation, singing songs with Timon and Pumbaa, Scar and the hyenas were enjoying the good life while lining the pockets of private equity with public money. We can't keep on Akuna Matata forever. We have got to take responsibility, if only to protect the privacy of our learner data. It's really time for Campus IT to take the lead again. Approach this critically. Don't assume the cloud, or at least don't assume the current cloud architecture. Develop a strategy. Think about the long-term protection, curation, et cetera, of private learner activity data. Think about things like consent, data locality, data server ownership, data retention periods, and data transfer. We're actually smart. I mean, if you start to think about it, and I'll be proposing ideas, and you will listen in this podcast, you're like, no one's ever thought of that, but we could just do it, right? We, we could build a thing. We could solve this problem of what about sensitive student data that we don't even want to possess. Why don't we build a thing that kind of does that? Wouldn't that be amazing, right? So we should retake the responsibility that has been always the remit of Campus IT. We should take it back. That's the mantle of what Campus IT has always been, and that is to work to protect students, protect faculty, and make sure that they're getting the best possible technology that they can. And I get it. We, we sort of wandered away Hakuna Matata to let Amazon grow up so that we could come back. So before I wrap up, I do want to thank my amazing peer reviewers. This is a peer reviewed podcast. I have an anonymous advisory board of over 40 people who look through outlines and drafts of all this work. They have contributed so much to my knowledge and to the quality of this podcast already and I owe them a debt of gratitude. I would thank them by name but then they really wouldn't be anonymous, nor they would they be secret, and that kind of defeats the purpose of them being my secret anonymous peer reviewers. So thanks for listening. Upcoming topics. You know, I want to talk about ed tech standards from a history perspective. Um, you know, we got some great standards, but we don't, I would like to tell you how those were founded and how they were formed. I want to take a look at Europe's GDPR regulation from two perspectives. The first perspective I want to look at is what's good about it. And the second perspective I want to look at is how some schools in some countries are completely sidestepping it. I'm also going to tell a scary hypothetical story about, uh, you know, a, a school, a teacher, some students, and a cloud-based LMS. That, I'll get that in an episode or two. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast, and I look forward to... Uh, Hearing your comments. See you on the net. Thank you for watching this episode of the LearnerPrivacy.org podcast.